Now, the Three Martini Lunch with Greg Columbus and Jim Garrity. And welcome, everyone, to the Thursday edition of the Three Martini Lunch, along with Jim Garrity of National Review. I'm Greg Corumbus of Radio America. We have bad, crazy, and crazy martinis for conservatives today. And just to let you know at the outset, first of all, we're sponsored by Simple Contacts. Right now, Three Martini Lunch listeners can get $20 off your first order of contacts at simplecontacts.com slash martini20 or enter the code martini20 at checkout. Also, we are recording this, at least the beginning of it, during the first break in the hearing involving Dr. Christine Blousey Ford. Uh, So uh, don't expect us to comment on any dramatic moments that have occurred after that. But, uh, uh, Jim, let's start with our bad martini, and that does deal with the first part of the hearing. We knew that coming in, uh, Chuck Grassley, the chairman of the committee, Dianne Feinstein, the ranking Democrat on the committee, would get opening statements. Dr. Ford would get a statement. And then there was going to be five-minute increments bouncing back and forth between the parties. Uh, asking her questions. And this has basically turned into uh, just a giant mess because, first of all, Grassley and Feinstein wasted gobs of time with really long opening statements, both of which just regurgitated their talking points, which we've heard now for the past week or two or however long it's been since we started hearing about these allegations. And then you've got this ridiculous process, which the Ford legal team demanded, of five-minute increments. So you've got this a sex crimes prosecutor the Republicans have hired, Rachel Mitchell, trying to establish a line of questioning. And then you've got Grassley interrupting her in the middle of a three-part question to kick it over to the Democrats because their five minutes are up. So everything is completely disjointed. The Democrats are lobbing her uh, softballs here, and uh, it's going to be pretty hard for Mitchell to really get on track with much of anything, it seems, at this point. So as of right now, uh, not a great day. Yeah. Uh, one of my colleagues had pointed out the argument that, look, this is the one time Senator Grassley has the entire world listening to him, and he can offer his account of how his committee has handled this from beginning up until this moment, and he has to take this opportunity to defend his name, defend the, defend the work of his staff, et cetera, et cetera. And I get that, um, but it's still added up to, I think, about the first... We, we didn't hear from uh, Ms. Ford until like 40 minutes into this, uh, which does not reflect well. This, you know, we, those of us who, who want to get to the bottom of this aren't interested in hearing two senators rehash uh, their arguments over the past week, um, by my count, as I, 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 you know, Feinstein began by saying she had some brief comments. So I wrote that down by my clock. She started about 1019 Eastern standard time, finished around 1032. So her brief comments took up 13 minutes. Uh, and unsurprisingly it was, you know, Grassley saying, uh, how bad Feinstein had handled this from the beginning and Feinstein turning around and really offering a litany of just about every allegation that had come up against, uh, Brett Kavanaugh since this began. Um, including I noted a couple times where she, she said, kept referring to all three women, which I believe also refers to uh, the allegations from Yale University and Michael Avenetti's client. God knows what's going through uh, Ms. Ford's mind right now. I'm sure this is difficult enough as is, but if I were her, I don't know if I would want to be lumped in with Cav- Avenetti's client claiming that when she was in college, she went to a lot of high school parties, 10 over a three year period all of which featuring weekly ritualized sexual assault committed by Judge Kavanaugh st- uh, starting at age 15. And oh, by the way, at some point she herself was assaulted uh, in 1982, and yet somehow she continued going to parties into 1983. Um, meaning I don't think the Democrats or critics of Kavanaugh help themselves by lumping all three together. In fact, you might argue uh, it's better for the Kavanaugh forces to lump them all together. Um, but either and I don't I think that this was, you know, it's so far an exhibition of what most irritates us uh, about uh, the U.S. Senate and about politicians in general. They try to make it about themselves. Um, they're kind of irrelevant here. No, nobody came to listen to you guys. We want to hear from the witnesses. We want to hear what they, you know, if you have questions, terrific. And I thought Mitchell was doing a fine job. I thought her tone was appropriate. I don't think you could say anything she had said came anywhere near badgering the witness or harassing. It was just attempting to go through piece by piece, step by step, uh, and observe any contradictions in her testimony or things that have changed uh, from account to account. Uh, I think she's doing a fine job. But again, this is in, in, you know, trying to overcome a format that is absolutely terrible. I desperately hope somebody can get to Grassley and say, you have to say, instead of doing this in five minute increments, we're doing this in 20 minute increments. Each party is going to get the same amount of time. Nobody complain about this, but this is too important to be done with uh, 
arbitrary uh, uh, time limits. And he did say something about, you know, he'll, he'll let people go over unless it's filibustering. Uh, unfortunately, he himself interrupted Mitchell the first time, and it just seemed deeply frustrating. And I think it impeded the search for the truth instead of helping it. Yeah, it was pointless, too. They were going over corrections to the letter that uh, that Ford sent to Senator Feinstein, which is interesting in and of itself. And she said there were three things she wanted to clarify and, and Grassley cut her off after the second one, which was completely pointless. Completely pointless. I'll tell you what's not pointless, though. Uh, being able to get contact lenses when you've run out and haven't been back to the eye doctor. Simple Contacts is the most convenient way to renew your contact lens prescription and reorder your brand of contacts from anywhere in minutes. It is vision care for the 21st century. The Simple Contacts vision test is self-guided and takes less than five minutes. Think of how much time you save compared to making an appointment, getting to the eye doctor, taking time off, and more. It's designed by doctors and licensed ophthalmologists review every single test carefully to make sure your eyes look healthy and that your vision hasn't changed. This is not, I repeat, not a replacement for your periodic full eye health exam, but it is a great option for times in between those regular eye doctor visits. Now, listeners, I wear contact lenses, and I've, I've myself have gotten lazy. I've forgotten to go to the eye doctor. It's such a magilla. I've, I've pushed off reordering. Ah, I, I can use the contacts I have. They'll last a little bit longer. Listeners, don't do what I did. <laughs> it's not good for you. It's not good for your eyes. And it's really inexcusable when Simple Contacts makes it so easy. Simple Contacts has all the brands and types of lenses that you're familiar with so that you never have to shop around to find your lenses at the best price. Simple Contacts has been rated five stars more than 4,500 times on the App Store. You can text with the support team and always get to speak with a real human being. No automated robot systems there. The vision test is only $20. Now compare that with an appointment, which without insurance could cost you up to $200. The contact lens prices are unbeatable. Standard shipping is free. And best of all, we have a promotion for our listeners. That's right. Right now, you can get $20 off your first order of contacts at simplecontacts.com slash martini20 or enter the code martini20 at checkout. That's simplecontacts.com slash martini20 or enter the promo code martini20 at checkout to get $20 off your first order of contacts. And Jim, let's move to our crazy martini today. I guess we have two of them. So here's our first crazy martini. It was just last week we were cringing as Ed Whalen put together his Google map theory about how it was perhaps somebody else because they lived closer to the pool that actually uh, assaulted uh, Christine Blasey back in uh, the early 1980s. And now there's a lot of people who were very interested in a detail from the Senate Judiciary Committee report last night uh, detailing that there might be other people who could have potentially done this. Uh, New York Post, two men who have come forward to members of the Senate Judiciary Committee to claim that they are the ones who actually assaulted Christine Blasey Ford during a House party in 1982 and not Supreme Court nominee Brett Kavanaugh. Republicans on the committee released a timeline of events late Wednesday, which included details about their interactions with the two men who admitted to the attacks. On Monday, the timeline recounts Geo staff members interviewing, quote, a man who believes he, not Judge Kavanaugh, had the encounter with Dr. Ford in 1982, unquote. The encounter refers to an episode in which Ford claims that Kavanaugh sexually assaulted her in a bedroom at a Maryland house party. They had a follow-up interview with that man, and he provided more detail about the assault. Then on Wednesday, the committee staff said they spoke with a second man who said he assaulted Ford in 1982. The committee did not release any more details about the men or why both were coming forward with the claims. Uh, Jim, I did see uh, comments from Senator Lindsey Graham, who fiercely defended Kavanaugh and slammed uh, Michael Avenatti yesterday, uh, saying the first guy in this story is a loon and he doesn't believe the other guy either. And he just wants to have a sober minded process here. So what do you make of all this? Yeah, uh, one of my colleagues had said, isn't it ironic that this hearings began with Cory Booker saying, I am Spartacus. And then it ends with its own I am Spartacus moment of many people coming forward and claiming, no, I'm the real person uh, who had this incident at this party back in the early 1980s. I assume Lindsey Graham has seen their testimony or seen what they submitted. Uh, if he says they're crazy as a loon, I, you know, uh, and, and the other one is implausible. I guess I've got no reason to not believe his assessment. Uh, at some point, maybe we'll get more information on this. The fact that Republicans are not really pursuing this theory with great intensity suggests they probably have their own doubts about it. It is This may be proving that, yes, this was indeed a case of mistaken identity, or this may simply be proving that there are a lot of nutcases out there who, who you know, for fame or out of uh, 
for for unfathom, unfathomable reasons have decided to come forward and say no no it was me uh and it let you i guess in, in effect it confessed to a crime um there is no statute of limitations for rape in the state of maryland uh you they may argue whether those actions uh rise to the level of attempted rape but uh you know, con- conceivably, these guys are, are uh, con- you know, confessing to a crime. For what it's worth, Ms. Ford said in testimony today um, that she is 100% certain that the person who attacked her was Brett Kavanaugh. So uh, we will see how this shakes out. It just kind of observes, um, very intriguing, that right before the hearing, everybody dumps all of the uh, information that they have. Um, and I think it's kind of, you know, indicates just how much partisan gamesmanship has been going on in this process since the very beginning. Yeah, and it's also a good lesson, and we had it a little bit earlier in the week, too, about believing things just because you kind of hope they're true. Uh, we saw it with the 4chan allegation that they suckered Michael Avenatti, and, and it was just totally a ruse. There was no actual client, and that's why he went dark on, on Twitter. We actually talked about that a little bit earlier in the week. Ultimately, it was a, a client whose allegation we have uh, torn apart pretty well here. But uh, nonetheless, uh, there was... Not everybody on Twitter, certainly uh, most reasonable conservatives were were having fun with it, but not necessarily assuming it was true. Others uh, really did think it was true. And, and I saw some of that last night with these allegations as well. It's kind of the same way the Democrats are treating every allegation against Kavanaugh as gospel truth, even though they're still not a corroborating witness or a shred of evidence on any of them. Look, this is a serious allegation, and it would be nice if it could be handled seriously and not everybody trying to... Uh uh connive and and you know leverage themselves for maximum partisan gain i noticed the fundraising messages were coming out during the uh the hearing today greg and, and you know from, from uh senator hirono and others you should not be looking at ooh, we can raise a lot of money from this particular set of circumstances if, you, if you've done that you kind of lost your soul i think all right let's move on to our final crazy martini now and kamala harris uh is the centerpiece of this one this is courtesy of uh, legalinsurrection.com Kamala Harris has joined the anonymous, unsubstantiated claim party because it's not just three accusers now, Jim. I don't know if we're up to four or five or this is six or we're back to five because the one from Rhode Island recanted his allegation. And then there was the the one written in about second grade quality grammar out in Colorado. And now there's uh, Kamala Harris, who is uh, getting in on this as well. Here's what it says. You had to know California's junior senator would get in on the anonymous, uncorroborated claim party. Late Wednesday night, Kamala Harris introduced a new accusation against Judge Kavanaugh. Harris claims an anonymous woman alleges a Kavanaugh gang rape party in the back seat of a car. None of the details have been provided, including place, date, and alleged accomplices, uh, although it is alleged that there were multiple people involved, including Kavanaugh. And that's literally all we have. Uh, there's this uh, letter that uh, is out there, and it obviously describes a very disturbing thing, a, discur- dis- a disturbing crime, if in fact it happened. But uh, there's literally no detail at all, except that it happened in a car. I don't know if we need to do this now. I don't know if we need this after the fate of Kavanaugh's nomination is resolved, but I really would like someone from the FBI uh, to come out and explain what they need to investigate a crime. Uh, we got a little bit of this from Joe Biden and the statement from the Hill hearings where he said, look, the FBI is not going to draw a conclusion from this. They will take statements from both sides, but they don't say who is right because uh, that's not in their job description. That's not what they do in these circumstances. I, look, full stop. 100 percent underline flashing red neon sign sexual assault is serious and it needs to be prosecuted whenever it occurs but to prosecute it uh you basically need the victim to come forward you you really can't make an anonymous accusation and then not provide any evidence and in this case the, that harris is pointing to uh, we, well, we've said you know that there's no specific date put forth by uh, Ms. Ford, she's can you know believes it was the summer of 1982 or late spring, sometime around the uh, the end of her sophomore year of high school. Um, we don't have a specific location, um, but at least you could say eventually Ford herself is, is came forward and is now testifying today under oath and under penalty of perjury. This letter that Kamala Harris is like, I, I really want to look. I, I, you kind of almost want to picture the FBI just like, what am I supposed to do with this? Where, where do I even begin? You know, you could you could say to uh, as the committee did to Kavanaugh, did you do this? And Kavanaugh said, no, I didn't. And then what? There's no crime scene to investigate. There's no other witnesses listed. There's no date to narrow this down. Uh, there's no other corroborating evidence. There's no DNA. There's no 
uh, you know, videotape, photographs, audio, nothing. The, the, you know, uh, you can't track somebody by their cell phone movements. I mean, all the stuff we look. People read crime novels and police procedurals and CSI and, and watch shows about all those. People know all the tools and all the resources that are at the fingertips of law enforcement when they have enough to work on. But if you don't give them the who, what, when, where, how, and why, or at least your best explanation of all that, they really can't do anything with this. And the Kamala Harris was the state attorney general of the state of California. She knows all this stuff. So again, at this point, just more another example of the partisan games being played and uh, just, just extraordinarily frustrating uh, that people wouldn't recognize that, look, if you make an anonymous accusation, it's not going to go anywhere because people can't evaluate the accuser and you don't provide any specifics of the who, the when, the where and things like that. Going to be quite a day, Jim. I'm sure I'll have much more to say about it tomorrow. We still have most of the questioning to go here uh, with uh, Dr. Ford. And then, of course, we have everything with uh, Judge Kavanaugh still to come this afternoon. So buckle up. We'll talk to you tomorrow. See you tomorrow, Greg. Jim Garrity of National Review. I'm Greg Corumbus of Radio America. Thanks for being with us today. Don't forget to visit our friends over at Simple Contacts and get $20 off your first order of contacts, simplecontacts.com slash martini20. And tune in again Friday for the next Three Martini Lunch.